All right. I believe I have uh, a really great show for those that are tuning in. I have with me today somebody that we actually owe uh, a lot of gratitude towards. Uh, this is a veteran that served in the United States Air Force and did a lot for our country. We're going to go into that. Also, an international spy for the CIA. We won't be able to go as deep because a lot of that information is classified. Uh, but Andrew Bustamante, thank you so much for coming on today's show. Stephen, I'm super happy to be here, man. Thanks for having me. And I mean, there's so much to talk about. It's uh, it's taking everything in me not to like jump into this conversation, man. Oh, yeah. Well, um, just up front, uh, Andrew is the founder of Everyday Spy, and I will put a link down below. But I, I want to get right into one question that um, ha has been on my mind and wanted to get a feel for, for what you think. I feel like the American people have pretty mixed feelings about the CIA. On the one hand, it's like, okay, wait a minute, I want the country to be safe. On the other hand, uh, there's, there's worry because of President John F. Kennedy. Was there CIA involvement? Was it rogue CIA people? Was it not? Uh, President Donald Trump's not really desiring to use the CIA uh, during his presidency. But at the end of the day, from your experience inside the Bureau, does the CIA keep the United States safe? And what is the exact purpose of the CIA today? You know, the, the reputation that the CIA has with the American people is a well-earned reputation, right? They, I mean, let's be honest. Prior to 2001, prior to the September 11 attacks in 2001, Nobody really knew that the CIA did much. And then to be frank, 9-11 was a massive intelligence failure, which just kind of demonstrated the existing notion that CIA was, you know, not engaged, not paying attention and, and, not, and didn't have much oversight. So I completely sympathize and agree with all those people who have a negative opinion about CIA. But I need to make sure that you and everybody else paying attention right now understands that Pre-9-11 CIA is a completely different animal than post-9-11 CIA. And a big part of the reason that you saw such a huge change in oversight, authority, professionalism, organization, communication, uh, the reason you saw that huge change in, in 2001 was because the American people and the U.S. Congress got involved in intelligence reform. Right prior to 2001, going all the way back into the 60s and 70s, CIA was a tool of the executive branch, which technically means it was a tool of the president to execute whatever the president wanted to do. That's why you had Bay of Pigs. That's why you had disasters in Cuba. That's why you had all sorts of you know uh, sketchy operations that have made it into history books that are very real and very true, and why there are all these uh, conspiracy theories surrounding this one organization that was so secret and basically above the law during that period of time. But all of that changed when 2,997 Americans died on September 11th. On that day, the, the, the entire, the hammer of the legislative branch came crashing in like it's supposed to do, right? This is why we have checks and balances in our government. So the reforms that came out of 9-11 that took hold in 2003 and have gone on to create the professional foundation of CIA since 2003 are, are really top notch, first rate, you know, best in the world kind of uh, level of class and professionalism. So from my time inside CIA, 100% what CIA is doing today is there to protect the American people. Okay. And the, the pendulum has swung so far in that direction that even the senior administrators and senior leaders at CIA, they hesitate to take certain risks because they don't want to continue to propagate this idea that CIA operates independently on its own without oversight. Okay. Now, that, that's really interesting that uh, it, that was a demarcation of like, okay, we have to be more organized. There has to be more transparency where before, like you say, you know, did, did Truman and others... Uh, you know, George Herbert Walker Bush being connected, did he just use them as his personal police? And so there, there is, there's a lot of like, you know, people know they need the FBI and the CIA, but they don't really know what they do. And are they good? Or are they bad? You know, so I appreciate you bringing some, some clarification to that. 
Now, uh, you served in the Air Force. Uh, I almost went into the Air Force in 2003 uh, as we were, you know, sending missiles over to uh, the Middle East, but I ended up in school, but you ended up in the Air Force. Were you, you were in the Air Force before or after the CIA? Before. So CIA recruited me out of the Air Force. I was an Air Force Academy graduate. So I actually became a commissioned officer in 2003 when you were also considering going in. Okay. And, uh, and then I spent five years with the Air Force and ended up transitioning to CIA. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. I know uh, one of the big universities within 50 miles of me is BYU, Brigham Young University. I know the FBI and the CIA heavily recruit out of that because of knowing multiple languages and, yep. and high IQs and all that. So um, now when you were in the Air Force, what, what specifically did you do? Because as I, as I read online, uh, you, you were over, uh, I believe, intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and things like that. So give us a little background on that. Yeah, so within the Air Force, I was uh, I was in a career category known as missileer, which is technically called a 13 Sierra within the Air, the Air Force Specialty Code system. And what that meant is that I was a, a commanding officer over a, a nuclear missile capability. Now, when I started, I came in just like most lieutenants as a low level, you know, missile co-commander, if you will. And I sat in a missile silo underground or a missile launch control capsule underground with a senior officer managing and maintaining 10 nuclear missiles with anywhere from three to 10 warheads on each nuclear missile. But by the time I left the Air Force five years, four years later, uh, I had graduated up, I had been promoted up to become the command uh, post commander for uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, which put me in command of all 200 nuclear missiles at the time that were in um, Malmstrom, each warhead or each missile containing three to 10 warheads each. Oh, wow. Now, is that the one that the, the, they were worried the Chinese spy balloon was stopping over? That's exactly right. Okay. Yep, that's exactly right. Oh. That was Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. So they may, may or may not have been trying to gather data on that particular nuclear intercontinental ballistic missile unit. Uh, Correct. And better understand what we have in our arsenal. And there's a long history, especially in Malmstrom. Even while I was commander there, there was a, a long history of strange sightings in the sky, uh, strange uh, UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them. Um, we were, of course, primarily concerned with them being intelligence collection efforts from foreign adversaries because our nuclear capability, our nuclear readiness, uh, our nuclear modernization. Uh, inside the United States, whether it's Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, whether it's uh, uh, the air, the nuclear base that we have in um, North Dakota, or whether it's the nuclear base that we have in Wyoming, in each of those three nuclear ICBM bases, you know, we have uh, a lot of diligence and attention that goes into making sure that we don't have foreign collection uh, efforts happening above us because of all of our own proprietary and national security secrets that we're holding in those nuclear bases. Okay, interesting. Now, does the does the CIA do most of their recruiting out of the US military or was was that uh unique to you? What how does It's that... actually yeah, I would say about about one third of all CIA's recruiting comes out of the military. Okay. And a big part of that is because when CIA recruits from the US military, they're not just getting an individual with talent they're getting an individual with talent plus a, a history of government documentation in addition to that. Medical documentation, psychological documentation, performance history, right? Along with all the institutionalization that the military has put into that individual. So paramilitary officers, analytical officers, covert action infrastructure officers, uh, uh, collection officers, technical officers, hackers, they all come from the military with that you know, long tail of documentation. But then a solid two thirds of what CIA recruits comes from the civilian world. And it's important because what they really are looking for is that cutting edge, creative, adaptable, modern thinker who's going to push intelligence into the next era. Whenever you only recruit from the military, whether you like it or not, you're bringing in institutionalized thinkers. Okay. If But when you want to continually advance 
uh, continually advance and evolve your operations, you need to pull from the civilian sector, the modern technological sector, uh, the leadership and entrepreneurial sector, because that's where you get those forward thinkers who are going to take your institution to the next, you know, the next 10 to 20 years. Gotcha. Okay. Now, um, we, we talked last time about the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, we're now going into 18 months of this. Um, what has been uh, shocking as somebody that's trained in the armed services, but also in the CIA, about the direction of where, where the war is going now? I know uh, a year ago, your thinking may have been different uh, yeah. as far as Russia kept trying to come to the table and seek peace. And the United States, the United Kingdom didn't necessarily want to do that. But then on top of that, you had Ukraine with this like, you know, spirit uh, and, and love for their country wanting to fight. What, what are some of the surprising or shocking things as, as you've watched this war unfold? There are so many shocking elements, right? So first of all, the, the I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll run the risk of boring you just a little bit by going all the way back to the beginning. Russia's invasion was shocking because that's an that is that tech that technique of inter uh, interstate warfare where one country invades another country is so old school. It's so obsolete that it doesn't even really get taught anymore in modern day uh, tactical um, schools, right? Like the Army War College, the Air Force War College, they don't teach that anymore because it's so obsolete. It's all about, you know, very, uh, very strategic, tactical attacks that incur in a specific location. It's not a national takeover like what you saw Russia try to do in Ukraine. But then, of course, Ukraine's ability to resist that invasion was equally shocking. And I don't just mean shocking to me. I mean shocking to every first world intelligence service out there. Every assessment everywhere from the UK to, to Russia to China and even into the United States Everyone anticipated Ukraine would fall within two to four weeks. It didn't. Not only did they not fall, but they were able to generate support from NATO, who had previously rejected their bid to become part of NATO, right? They were able to generate support from NATO to then continue to resist for many more months. And then, of course, in August of 2022, you saw their first counteroffensive, which took back huge swaths of land. So now not only did you have them resisting the invasion, but you also had them running this counteroffensive. So you're exactly right. My assessment in 2022 was very much informed by my experience with CIA and my experience with my peers who were still active in private and national security intelligence. And for the most part, we were all continually shocked by how Ukraine rose above the expected uh, level. Now, one area that is very relevant right now that I think is also kind of shocking and still the majority of the American people are blind to it, is the fact that Ukraine is an intensely corrupt country. People, people don't understand, and if they have heard me say this, they have not accepted Ukraine is a very corrupt country. It is not a democracy. It was never a democracy. It scored three out of 10 on the Democratic, on the democracy uh, uh, index by non, by third party uh, NGOs in 2019. So it is not a democracy. So the, the narrative that we're defending democracy by defending Ukraine is a false narrative, right? It's not true. We are there for other reasons, national security, defense reasons for sure, but it's not about protecting democracy in Ukraine. And the announcement that actually just happened on Labor Day this year, right, yesterday, um, President Zelensky actually ousted his, his uh, defense minister. And the reason that he ousted that defense minister was because they finally have admitted long-term corruption in the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine. Think about this, man. A year and a half ago, we were taught people were talking about the corruption in Ukraine and the national press, the, uh, you know, the trolls of the world, the left leaning liberals of the world were lambasting anyone who said Ukraine was corrupt. They were just it was outright just vitriol against anybody who tried to bring that to light. Well, now, 18 months in, Ukraine's losing support from NATO. They're losing support from Poland. They're losing support from the American people. They recognize that their counteroffensive is not having the success they wanted it to have. And in order to try to change the narrative, try to get that support back, 
Zelensky is being forced to finally accept and admit that there are corruption issues within his country, that the aid and the weapons that have been sent there have been sold in the black market, have been you know, overpriced, have been corrupted by the, by the fact that they don't have a, prof they did not have a standard auditable uh, professional military service going on there, right? So he took out his current defense minister. That defense minister is now most likely being reassigned to be the ambassador to, to the UK on behalf of Ukraine because he's built such a reputation with the, with the Brits specifically. But then the new defense minister that Zelensky has identified has no military background. The guy is a specialist, get this, he's a specialist in negotiating with Russia. So the new defense minister of Ukraine is not a military person. He is a strategic negotiator specifically with Russia. So what that tells me is that Zelensky is finally realizing he can't continue to sit behind a pulpit and talk about how they're going to win this war and they're going to take back every inch of territory that Russia has ever taken. Instead, he's finally realizing, you know what? The West is getting impatient with our progress. We are being seen as the, the fallible country that we really are. And we need to seriously consider how we're going to negotiate some kind of reasonable peace or at least negotiate a ceasefire with the Russians because in a long-term protracted war, Ukraine knows they don't have the resources to maintain that. So I think that you're st you're really starting to see it when you look at the makeup of what Zelensky is doing internally, from the corruption issues in the Ministry of Defense to the changes of leadership within the Ministry of Defense, um, and all of this at the same time that the world is trying to put an eye on Putin and talk about how weak Putin is and how failed Russia is. Instead, all that narrative is just kind of hiding what's really happening in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, if, if people go back and look at my channel, I didn't even cover the war the first six months because I just kept thinking R R Russia's going to just steamroll these guys or this thing's going to go to peace talks. Yep. Then I decided, wait a minute, they, they just sent another couple billion dollars to Ukraine. Meanwhile, I'm seeing hurricanes in Florida, not Americans not getting help. Now we're seeing the people in Maui, Hawaii, not getting the help they need. And it really started to irritate me. So then I started, you know, covering the war and I realized, wait a minute, the, the, the left-leaning media of the United States and of Britain is pushing this narrative down the throat of the American people. Meanwhile, the news coming out of China and India and Pakistan and other areas it was very different. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay. I'm going to try to find a blend and find really good guests to, to speak in the middle and, and try and tell the truth. The other thing that was really shocking to me is when Russia said that part of their mission was to go in and wipe out Nazis. I thought you guys are about 70 years late to the game. And then I find out just how many, uh, just how many Nazis are still in Ukraine and how they were bullying the, the citizens there and, and almost like a mafia group running the country, telling Zelensky what to do. And then when it came out that uh, he had to fire most of his cabinet for corruption, I was like, okay, I, I feel like we're being uh, fed a bunch of lies. Now, I do not have anything against the Ukrainian people. I hope that this war ends. I want the, the killing to end, but I also want the truth to be told and so, yeah, I saw just this morning that the defense minister was being yanked, but I didn't. I did not realize the new person has no military experience. Yeah, it's really fascinating to look at it, man, because you're exactly right. You've also been reading headlines from left-leaning media sources about how Ukraine is supporting these attacks deep into Russia, right? Drone attacks in Moscow, attacks on military bases. The majority of those attacks actually are not being formally sponsored by the Ukrainian military. That doesn't mean that Ukrainian military is not aware of them or coordinating them, but they are they're walking a tightrope where if they admit that they have any that they've sanctioned these attacks, they risk losing US and NATO support because that's been a hard line for us. You, we will not support attacks into Russia. And a lot of that goes into, you know, our our hopes that we can negotiate that Russia will withdraw from Ukraine by basically promising that we will protect Russian um, 
the, the Russian soil, sovereign Russian soil, right? The people who are prosecuting those attacks are extremists and neo-Nazis, to your exact point, right? So the people who have come to the help of Ukraine and launched these attacks into Russia are exactly the kind of people that validate Putin's claims for why he wants to attack Ukraine. So, you know, Zelensky's in a rough spot. Rus Ukraine's in a rough spot because they're trying to collect help from anybody they can. But, you know, sometimes you don't like your bedmates and sometimes those bedmates make you look bad. And that's exactly what's happening here. Do they like that there's bombs and drones going off in, in the middle of financial district Moscow? Yeah, the Ukrainians like that. But do they like that they're being piloted and coordinated by you know Russian extremists, neo Nazis, and and uh, and white supremacists? No, they don't like that. But you know how how do you manage that public reputation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, as somebody who was in the military, the the Air Force, um, and over two hundred different missiles, talk talk to the American people here for a minute about maybe just from Putin's standpoint as the United States and NATO moved further east with these Tomahawk missiles and, and these other missiles that could reach Moscow within minutes. Uh, how, how, did that, uh, how did that inform or uh, maybe decide some of the reasoning behind Vladimir Putin's aggressive stance towards Ukraine, where missiles could literally hit St. Petersburg or Moscow within minutes? Yeah, you know, it's it's unfortunate because there has been so much negative conversation. There's been so much negative press behind Putin's very legitimate claim that the encroachment of NATO following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989 is in large part what led him to take the actions that he's taken in the last 10 to 15 years, right? But you're exactly right, Stephen. If if anybody puts themselves in the shoes of the head of state of Russia, it's very easy to see that in night prior to 1989, everybody signed a treat a, a peace treaty. NATO signed an agreement that said they would not go further east of the of the uh, westernmost border of the Soviet Union. Right, that was a promise. But then when the Soviet Union fell. Then NATO, specifically the United States, took it upon themselves during the Cold War, of course, to say, well, hey, our previous treaty said that we wouldn't go beyond the border of the Soviet Union, but now there is no Soviet Union, so our previous contract is null and void. That's not actually how it works, right? The, the spirit of the law was still there, but the United States took advantage of that opportunity to gain ground and gain influence because the United States is a country that recognizes that the true, we recognized first that the true global power comes from global economic trade. So we wanted to increase as many trading partners as we could. And if we could take trade partners away from Ru Russia, then we're just increasing our national GDP and increasing the opportunity that exists for us economically to essentially leverage our economic might over other countries. That's how we took control of Europe. It's how we've gained so much leverage in Europe. It's why France and Italy and Germany and the UK don't actually like the United States, right? They cooperate with us, but you don't see them speaking favorably about us. And it's because they know we're just economic bullies. So that we, so we did that and we continued to let NATO expand to the East closer and closer to Russia's borders. And every time NATO took on a new uh, a new member closer to Russia, then they were equipped with NATO weapons. Well, what are NATO weapons? NATO weapons are American weapons, right? And that's, and Russia saw that happening in many ways. That's what drove the Russian people to choose Putin as their leader. And that's what made Putin say, okay, I'm going to tell the whole world in no uncertain terms that the that Ukraine is the true border. If you violate, if you threaten Russia by allowing Ukraine to be considered a member of NATO, that will be a step too far. And that is what drove him to take the action he took on Ukraine, right? Was it, was it, is he a victim? No, he is not a victim. He is an aggressor, but he is acting in a national security predictable manner, right? And that's why you continue to see nuclear weapons have not been deployed because nuclear level escalation is not where we are in terms of the the game of war right now, right? We are very much in 
exactly where we are, where you see us. We are in a stalemate of a world of increasing defensive lines and trying to uh, reduce logistical support for both parties. Russia is trying to reduce log logistical support to Ukraine by essentially waiting them out, and it's working. Ukraine is trying to reduce logistical support to Russia by blowing up bridges and railways. That is also working, right? So you can see exactly where we are in this game of war very clearly because we're in the middle of it right now. Yeah. Uh, go going back to Europe and their relationship with the United States, um, I have to imagine they are wanting this war to end faster than the Biden administration only because they need that affordable Russian energy, natural gas and, and oil and, and gas at the pump, uh, especially with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being destroyed. Um, do you think Germany and France and, and some of the other big NATO partners, do you see them holding out as long as the United States? Or do you see them uh, saying, listen, we're, we're going to pressure you to get to the peace table only because we can't financially support you anymore. It, it's literally hurting us now to a point where we're, we're going to have backlash from our own citizens. Yeah, well, we're, we're entering into what I call a season of carve outs. And what I mean by that is all of your NATO countries and, and the United States is included. Did you know, Stephen, that the U.S. has carve outs where we're still supporting Russia? We're still working with Russia on multiple economic and, and military fronts but we carve them out of the overall sanctions, right? So for example, NASA has a carve out because the only way you're gonna get American astronauts into space is on Russian rockets. Okay. So there's a carve out that allows NASA to continue working with Russia's space agency to take American astronauts to the International Space Station. So even though we talk about sanctions and evil, eh, it's really, we're much more pragmatic than that, right? So you're going to see the same carve outs start to happen. They've already been happening, but you'll see more of them happen. Not necessarily because Europe is dependent on cheap Russian energy. Yes, that hurts them. You saw the pain they felt last winter. They're getting ready to feel that same pain again this winter. They don't have the infrastructure in place to replace Russian energy yet. They are able to like park tankers off the shoreline and use them as temporary storage locations. But they also had a mild winter last year, and they still lost 67,000 people. 67, 60-ish thousand people died last winter because of the sanctions that Europe put on Russia, right? And nobody talks about that. So this winter could be even worse, and Europeans know that. The bigger challenge for them is, is their relationship with China, because Russia and China have taken a close relationship as members, co-members of the BRICS trading bloc. And for sure, Germany and France are heavily dependent on their relationship with China. So if China penalizes them for their stance against Russia, even if it's just administrative or political, right, then that puts enough emphasis on places like France, Germany, and, uh, and, uh, and the UK that they'll create more carve-outs to give a little bit of a reprieve to the Russians. Okay, interesting. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on the, this... BRICS nation. I know they've been around for a long time, but it seems like uh, ever since COVID and the beginning of this war, that this idea is taking hold around the globe, uh, this threat to the United States dollar. But but more than that, just the, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, corporate capture or weaponization of key elements like oil and gold that these BRICS nations are hoarding like crazy, how that could, you know, you know, come back to us in the form of extremely high prices. What, what are your thoughts on the, on this BRICS nation push? It's for sure something that everybody should be paying attention to. And the, the thing to understand is that Americans have a huge advantage in staying ahead of where the BRICS nations and the BRICS trading block is going, because what the BRICS nations are doing is essentially replicating exactly what we did coming out of World War II. The United States holds the largest gold reserves in the world, not by a little bit, but like four times as much, right? We hold 400% more gold than places like Sweden or Norway or some of the other wealthy countries, right? And it was because we had such massive gold reserves that we chose to stop tying the US dollar to gold in the 1970s, I wanna say it was. 
So we floated the US dollar because we had the largest gold reserves. Nobody could tell us not to. We essentially used economic dominance to dictate policy to everybody else. And they were all already like wedded to the dollar as it was. So what the BRICS nations have done is they've they've learned from the school of capitalism, our school, that monopolies only exist as long as a better alternative doesn't present itself. So they got together and they presented a better alternative to developing nations. Now, what's happened is that we've become so polarized in our country that now even our closest friends look at us and they don't really know what to expect, right? Like, do, do they get a president like Donald Trump or do they get a president like Joe Biden? You couldn't think of two more different people to take office. And that doesn't make our partners comfortable. They want, they want back the days where there was general predictability, right? There wasn't that much of a difference between Bush and Clinton, right? They both had like 80% of their, of their uh, oratory was the same. 20% of it was different and we can understand that. When, the other, when it's only 20% the same and 80% different, people get really unsettled. So they're looking for an alternative. BRICS offers that alternative. And you can see that the BRICS countries just met at the end of August to take on new members. We still call it BRICS as if there's only five trading members. There's like 15 trading members now. And among that roster includes countries like Saudi Arabia, a close ally to the United States, the United Arab Emirates, another close ally to the United States, Indonesia, a close ally to the United States. Their roster keeps building with countries that are developing and wealthy in the developing world and are also used to be sympathetic towards the United States and democracy. And now they're choosing a pragmatic solution like BRICS over an ideological solution like NATO and the G7 countries, because our world is deciding, like we're evolving, maturing into a place where we ask ourselves, should globalization be ideological, where you enforce this idea of democracy, or should economic trade be pragmatic and practical? where it's really about what's best for the country that's participating in the trading relationship. And you know, for a long time, America dominated the narrative by saying everybody had to be a democracy and the whole world went along with it. But now after seeing democracy fail multiple times in multiple countries, watching the United States fail in multiple wars like Vietnam, the Gulf War, uh, Korea, Afghanistan, we've got enough egg on our face that people are asking themselves the question like, you know what, maybe democracy and a US led economic world isn't the best thing for us. And each country is coming to that conclusion on their own and they're choosing an alternative, which is breaking down the monopoly the United States has had for so long. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, been very interesting to watch and to cover uh, as a as a journalist, um, I think I read one time. Maybe I have the number wrong, but the United States has like nine thousand tons of gold. Uh, it, it's just like a ridiculous amount, and but they keep it off of the Fed's uh, balance sheets. And I, I've read books that say one day they'll bring that back on, and that's how they will, you know, manage this massive thirty-two trillion dollar debt situation that we're in. But it is. It's a. It's a massive amount of gold and a, a massive amount of military um, that the the rest of the world would would have to deal with. Um, as as you were, I know. I know we can't go too deep because a lot of what you did is is, uh, is classified. But as, as an international spy, when you left the United States to serve the United States, was was there something about living outside of the United States that shocked you, maybe for good or bad, that just really caught you off guard? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because the first time I spent a significant time abroad was when I was with the Air Force Academy. I was in college still, and I got picked up to go on a study abroad program. I was studying Chinese, and they sent me to Beijing to study abroad for six weeks. And it was my first long-term stay overseas. Now, I had been to Mexico like most college students, right? Um, but it wasn't until I got to China where I was, where I realized, you know, if, for example, you can't drink the water in China, the water that comes out of your faucet, the water that comes out of a water fountain, the water that comes out of like a fountain drink machine at a, at a restaurant, you can't drink it. It's not reliably clean. Wow. In the United States, any place where water is served, you can drink it and if and you can count on it being clean and sanitary. 
for the majority of the world, you can't do that. Even in Europe, you can't really count on the water that comes out of a pipe to be clean and sanitary, right? And that was a shocking thing to me because I was like, wait a second. You mean there are there are entire populations, there are entire countries that already know that the only way you can drink reliable water is if it comes out of a can or a bottle or a box that's been sealed, right? It, they have to boil their water before they drink it in 2023. It's insane to think of it that way, right? And in, in many ways, what really, what I came to appreciate traveling the world with CIA is that the United States, the reason we have the reputation of being fat, dumb, and happy in every other country out there, nobody really says good things about American people. They all, they accuse us and they, do, and they chide us for how spoiled we are. And what came to shock me was that we really are pretty spoiled. We really are so wealthy and so comfortable in our daily life, we don't even think about survival, right? We might think about how do I pay my electric bill, but that's completely different than thinking about how do I keep from freezing tonight? Yeah. So much of the world is literally in survival mode. They don't know where they're going to get their food tomorrow. We are complaining about the fact that we can't feed inner city students fresh food because the only option they have is McDonald's. You see how completely different those yeah. two points of view are? So that was a big thing that really struck me. And I, I, it carries with me still today because I love being American. I love the American people. I love that we've built this world for ourselves where we don't have to be distracted by daily survival. But at the same time, it's given us a bit of a disadvantage in our ability to connect with other countries because they're kind of right. We don't know what it's like to spend a day in their shoes. And they would all kill to have one day in our shoes. Yeah, wow. I, I remember uh, Colonel Tony Schaefer, who I've had on my show a few times. He said to me in passing one time, you know, China's just as distracted by trying to get fresh water for a billion people as they are to become the next global superpower. I never, I didn't re ever really understand what he meant by that. But now that makes a lot more sense. If you've got you know, 1.3 billion humans that don't have access to clean water and just how, like how many medical issues that could create, yep. uh, food issues, um, foodborne illnesses. Uh, God, no wonder they have, you know, all these avian flus and, yep. and all this, if it's all in the water, that that's pretty scary. So thank you. Thank you for helping me understand what, uh, what he meant by that. Um, yeah, we are, we're, we're blessed here, but sometimes, that uh, comfort makes us lose our edge and mm -hmm. that grit uh, when we are presented with those opportunities. Um, and I agree. I agree that we are blessed. I use the word spoiled and kind of like a, I'm being, I'm being, you know, oversimplistic and negative. We are absolutely blessed. I will also say that it's, we're blessed by the generations that worked before us to bring us to this point. And the way that we bring honor to those previous generations is by recognizing and appreciating what they gave to us and then appreciating what we have so that we can keep it safe and secure for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and spoiled is not the wrong word. I remember living in the Dominican Republic for six weeks. Uh, I remember seeing like a family of four on one little scooter. Uh, the dad's driving, the mom's holding groceries, there's a little boy. And then at the back was this little girl with like a foam mattress up over the head and the mom's holding on backwards the little yeah. boys holding forwards uh you know there's they had no sewer systems uh they would always tell us do not drink the water you will get sick within one day and and so yeah we are it, it, it's spoiled but i i like it <laughs> i like it uh it, it, it's much better that way so um now as you uh as you went abroad you, you had mentioned to me offline and, and i don't think that there's anything um, secretive about this, but you you mentioned that the the CIA has a method for helping people learn new languages very quickly, then and that you've been able to pick up two or three yourself. Uh, is, is that like a specific methodology, or or how is that accomplished? Is that something that you can talk about? Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it is a methodology, and it's not necessarily unknown, but it's not actively practiced in most academic circles, which is what's really interesting. So the, the main difference between how CIA trains its officers 
And what most people experience in their day-to-day -day life is that most people are being taught through an academic lens, not an operational lens. CIA does all of their training through operational pragmatism, right? What do we need to do to get somebody operational and deployable? Whereas most of our world works in a way where it's like, how do we get somebody into an academic cycle where we can maximize the cost to them to learn a process, right? That's why university takes four years when you don't barely use anything you learn in university when you get out to the real world. You yeah. pay for something for four years to feed the GDP and to feed the economic establishment. And that's what keeps the country wealthy so that you can go then earn $60,000 a year doing nothing that you learned in college. Yeah. But my point with all of that is that CIA's methodology for teaching people language is something called high frequency use words. Okay. You basically take any language out there. If you boil basically any language down to a fifth grade reading level, you really only need to know about 2000 words. And those 2000 words are high frequency use words. If we were to run, and this might be a fun experiment for somebody listening, if we were to run an algorithm against this conversation that you and I just had, Stephen, and we were to actually have a transcript created that could then count the number of unique words that we actually discussed, that number would really only come out to about 1300 words. So we're not having any kind of advanced conversation. We're having essentially a conversation that any eighth grader could participate in. And we're only using about 1300 unique words. So that means that if you could teach somebody 1300 words, they could participate at an eighth grade level conversation anywhere in that country. That's a very operational way of thinking. You don't have to master accents. You don't have to master grammar. You don't have to master sentence structure. You don't have to be able to understand poetry. You don't have to be able to watch TV shows or movies or commercials. You really only need to have a basic understanding of the foundation high frequency use words. And that's how CIA teaches basically any language to basically any person in anywhere from nine to 16 months. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. It's smart. Uh, Tim Ferriss uh does something similar where he learns like the uh 20 most important verbs uh like go to the bathroom buy uh you know drive and, and then he, he learns those very very quickly in every language so that he can get his basic needs met within about 30 days um so that that's kind of what you're getting at is it's it's very calculated and systematic to get to the to the most important words that you'll be able to use in a conversation. Exactly right. And once you have those, now you have the ability to communicate. Again, all of the stuff that you've seen in media where spies are like perfectly fluent in a foreign language, that's the media. That's not real. Okay. Spies just need to gain an operational, uh, an operational fluidity uh, or an operational fluency so that they can be active in a location and get the job done. In many ways, what you're really doing is you're using a language to try to identify a different language that you can both co like communicate in. So I might learn just enough Khmer so I can talk to another person in Cambodia to confirm that they speak French. And then we'll flip to French, gotcha. right? Or I'll use just enough Russian so that I can confirm in Russia that this person actually speaks you know, Italian. So then we'll flip to Italian. That's really more of the functionality for how we use language. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, you mentioned in another podcast that the CIA has certain undercover groups that they refuse to be a part of. Um, I, I believe like priests and, and, and things like that. What, what, what is that? Uh, what, what are those uh, areas that the CIA has chosen to stay out of? And what was the, the thinking behind that? Yeah, there are certain. Um, so what we're talking about here is that when CIA operates undercover, they're very, very strict. Again, thanks to 9-11, they're very, very strict about what types of titles they use in their undercover operations, because they never want to allow a foreign adversary to prosecute a, an American citizen who's in a protected category. So, for example, You've heard of uh, NGOs like Doctors Without Borders or Nurses Without Borders, right? These are medical professionals who are American citizens volunteering their skills and their time to you know, help third world and developing nations. CIA does not want to embed an undercover officer in Doctors Without Borders because if they embed one undercover officer, 
it puts every American citizen participating in that operation, in that NGO, at risk. Because now China, Russia, Sudan, Niger can arrest them and, and hold them potentially on charges of espionage. It's much, much easier for the United States government and for the CIA to be able to say, there's no way that person is a spy. And here's 25 years worth of documentation saying that we don't use doctors in our undercover operations, right? So they do that with things like Doctors Without Borders. They do that with clergy. They don't use, they don't put people as undercover, you know, uh, priests or undercover uh, cardinals or, you know, anything else. They, they undercover rabbis. They don't do that because they want the clergy to be protected so that no clergy, no American clergy is ever held on suspicion of espionage. Uh, so doctors, clergy, uh, volunteers with the Peace Corps are another protected category. Uh, those people who go out and, and help impoverished nations develop education, develop businesses, microfinance, that sort of thing. So they've got all these categories that they carve out to make sure that American citizens who participate in those activities are protected and above suspicion of potential espionage. Okay, wow, interesting. Um, okay, final question. How much communication is happening between the CIA and the U.S. military? For example, uh, we, we hear about the United States is providing intel to Ukraine, or they're gathering intel against Belarus or against Russia, against Putin. Uh, is, is, does the CIA have people embedded that are then funneling back to the CIA and they're sharing it with the military? Or is there a direct relationship between certain undercover people and military? How, how does that work if you're allowed to share some of that? No, absolutely. So what you're getting at here is the, the professionalization of intelligence that came out of 9-11. So a new office was created after September 11th called the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI or the ODNI. That person oversees all intelligence collection and collect and intelligence sharing within the intelligence community, the IC, of which DOD has multiple elements in the IC, FBI, CIA, NSA, NGA, all the alphabet soup. So the way that it works in general is kind of both and, to your point. There are people from CIA, for example, who might be embedded in DOD, whose job it is to represent CIA within the halls of DOD for intelligence operations. And then there are people from DOD who are, who are forward deployed to CIA, whose job it is to coordinate DOD stuff with CIA. So there is that element of individuals who are representing their organization within another part of the IC. Then you also have this instance where IC partners just send reporting and send information to each other, right? So they'll compartmentalize it, classify it, et cetera, and they'll share it with other offices and other groups. Uh, however, the big kind of the, the elephant in the room is that they all speak different languages. So when FBI sends a report to CIA, it's written in FBI. So it's written with FBI acronyms and FBI details and FBI you know, prioritization, which doesn't translate into CIA acronyms, CIA prioritization, and CIA offices. So whenever you have those two reports that get shared back and forth, oftentimes they get filed to the bottom of the pile because nobody really knows what they're reading. So imagine that happening between you know, NRO, NSA, DOD, CIA, FBI, thousands of reports a day go unread by the other IC partners because they just don't know what they're reading. And there's only one or two forward deployed representatives who would actually be able to make sense of what they're reading. And they're oftentimes pulled into whatever the political fire is at the time for their organization. So you have both of those things happening. Uh, but the, to the kind of like the third element in this whole thing is that you also have this push towards generalizing intelligence community officers, which means you want them to take rotations in different offices. So a career NSA person should have a rotation in CIA and FBI and uh, NRO before they become a senior officer in their own home service. So you've got this rotationary thing going on as well, which is everyone's effort to try to make communication better without standardizing it across all the IC. Uh, it's not a perfect solution. It's why there's still mistakes. It's why things like Afghanistan were guessed wrong. It's why Ukraine was wrong, right? It's a big part of why uh, 
you know, former President Trump didn't trust CIA because he was like, where are you getting your information from? Are you getting it from FBI? Are you getting it from NSA? Are you collecting it yourself? And, you know, he, if and it's very difficult for people to t for IC, for intelligence professionals to talk about their sources and defend their intelligence. Um, so it, it became it's something that became very common to the American people to see the president distrust his own executive service. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting times we've lived through. Uh, if if people want to learn more about you, uh, one of the things I saw in our last interview is people are saying this guy is definitely still CIA. He's a spy. <laughs> you need to ask him if he is. I'm not going to ask because if you were, you wouldn't say. And if you're not, nobody would believe you. Right. So but uh when you're not on interviews, uh, tell us a little bit more about Everyday Spy, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my company, Everyday Spy, is a company where I'm dedicated to teaching everyday people how to use proven spy skills to win in everyday life. And we teach entrepreneurs, we teach moms and dads, we teach high-powered executives how to use everything from negotiation and persuasion all the way down to personal security and self-defense. How do you use what CIA has mastered and use it to, to get an unfair advantage in your everyday life. And you'll be able to learn everything you want to learn by going to my website at everydayspy.com. Or, or if you want to follow me on social media, you'll find me on every social media platform at Everyday Spy. And then, of course, if you are into podcasts or if you're a podcast person, you'll find the Everyday Spy podcast on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Any one of those options and you'll find your way to me and you'll find your way to learning more of what I have to teach. Oh, that's awesome. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming on. I know how busy your schedule is. We, we took a couple of months to coordinate this and I, I value your time and I will let you go. Thank you, Andrew Bustamante, for being on our show today. Thank you, Stephen. It was a pleasure being here, man.